in our section entitled Biomimetics is Professor Kenji Gano from the University of Melbourne. Thank you, there it is. Right, so like the rest of the people here, I'd certainly like to thank Ross and Dan for making me make the supreme sacrifice to come up to your food. And stuff. <coughs> uh, I certainly appreciate it. My wife appreciates it, Ross. Thanks very much. I also, uh, I guess from the chemist's point of view, I appreciate you putting me up in the last session with uh, Paul, um, the art of the dinner speaker as well, Paul. Cool. And it's Friday the 13th as well. So this should be fun this morning. All right, well, uh, <coughs> I was going to talk a little bit about uh, a chemical viewpoint in terms of what sort of structures are being developed to try and mimic the light harvesting processes and the photosynthetic processes uh, that we see in nature. And uh, I think because there's quite a lot of physicists here, it's probably worth just talking a little bit about what type of molecular structures are being developed to mimic these uh, processes. The other thing is I think we shouldn't be uh, get too hung up talking about mimicking uh, photosynthesis because as pointed out in some of the reading that's in the uh, workshop handbook, uh, of course <coughs> the photosynthetic unit, while it's uh, uh, quantum efficient, works quite well in terms of quantum efficiency, in terms of actually uh, converting the solar spectrum into useful energy, it's only about 5 to 10% efficient. That is, it doesn't use all the wavelengths that are accessible uh, to us. And of course, there's energy loss during the actual uh, light harvesting and the photosynthetic process itself. So in fact, we could improve, theoretically, we can improve the actual efficiency of the photosynthetic system. So this is a uh, slide I put up <coughs> when we're talking about the questions on the first day of the conference. And, uh, of course, this is a picture we've seen several times during the meeting, which illustrates the light harvesting pigment arrays in a photosynthetic, uh, a bacterial photosynthetic reaction centre. And these arrays, of course, are used to increase the absorption cross section of the reaction centre, which is here. And the energy is essentially funneled because there's an energy gradient of light harvesting pigments. If you go from V875 to V850, in this case, uh, right through the, the light harvesting two, light harvesting one complexes to the reaction centre. And of course this is an efficient process, but energy is lost along the way. And the structures of these pigments, of course, have been developed to maximise the light collection efficiency, the energy transport mechanisms, as we've already seen, and ultimately the photosynthetic reaction centre, uh, of course, is also a design system, an evolutionary design system, to maximise um, the efficiency, if you like, of the charge separation process. And I alluded to the fact, of course, that they don't look like this. They're all held in a matrix, a protein matrix, a lipid matrix, and as we've already seen, I guess the question I posed has been answered um, several times, and that is that the proteins uh, obviously play a role in a structural role in orienting these components. It may also play a, uh, like a quantum role, actually, uh, controlling these energy transport processes. Uh, what I want to do is just talk briefly about the type of mimics that are being used to uh, mimic the charge separation process and also the light harvesting process with the particular emphasis on some of our own systems. So the sorts of uh, <coughs> systems we're trying to mimic, this is the photosynthetic or the bacterial photosynthetic reaction centre here. Uh, I spoke about uh, this arrangement, of course, the other day, but essentially after the light collection or the light harvesting, it's delivered to the special pair, and then we get a charge, cross-membrane charge separation. It doesn't happen in uh, one step as indicated here, but in about 200 picoseconds, we get charge transport across the membrane between the special pair and the quinone. And it actually occurs in a multi-step process, and this, of course, is designed so that we get efficient charge separation, but the charge recombination is uh, slow, and therefore there's time for other processes to happen. So as I mentioned before, this sort of transmembrane potential, there is ways we might think about making this more efficient than in the photosynthetic reaction centre. The light collection, for instance, we might think about using both high energy and low energy photons to collect the light more efficiently. And also energy is lost during this process, 
maybe there's a way to actually uh, get more efficient energy conversion. So the two steps, what approaches can be used to mimic the charge separation steps, what needs to be improved, and of course if we're talking about the light harvesting area, what molecular structures can be used to simulate that. Okay, so I thought I'd just illustrate this with an example. There are of course lots of work that's been done over the last couple of decades really on photosynthetic mimics, particularly the uh, charge separation uh, mimics. And <coughs> this is a common uh, process or common structure that's used. First of all, have got another uh, laser pointer? It doesn't matter too much. But often you'll see people want to use a multi-step electron transport process so that uh, ultimately the charge separation occurs over a large distance and therefore charge recombination is uh, diminished or the rate of it's diminished and we have a long charge separation lifetime. And often in these systems, and this is an example of used here, <coughs> portrait arrays have been used. So structures have been made where various portraits are connected, usually using covalent linkages. And often you'll see a metal portrait, a zinc portrait, connected to a free base portrait here. And these systems, like absorbed by a a zinc porphyrin in this case um, can undergo energy transfer to a free base porphyrin. And then there's an electron acceptor where we get electron transport step. And of course that creates a hole or if you like a reverse electron transport, uh, transport step back along the system and you can have electron donor up this end. So ultimately energy transfer, electron transfer, hole transfer steps so that you get charge separation over considerable distances. And of course, the design of these bridges and the various donor and acceptor pairs uh, people use all sorts of systems, but the idea is to get charge separation over a large distance, so it simulates what happens in the photosynthetic centre. So I just want to talk briefly, just in a few slides, about the type of systems. These ones, of course, are drawn from our own work, and these were developed by the actual structures, were synthesised with Max Crossley's group, and of course, I'll point out the people responsible best in these overhead, so uh, Paul Sintix and uh, James Hutchison, a student with mine, Paul with Max, were involved with synthesising these molecules and studying them. <coughs> so these are porphyrin arrays, you see the zinc porphyrin here, the three base porphyrin, linked by a trogus base here, and a bichronoxylene linker here. Now notice that the accept electron acceptor here is a gold porphyrin, so we're actually using the methylation here of porphyrins to alter the redox properties of these materials and therefore this acts as our electron acceptor and then we can get whole transfer back to the uh, zinc port from here. And this is a tetrad where again the separation occurs over very large distances. So in this case we can excite the zinc porphyrin, get energy transfer to these free base porphyrins, then electron transfer and then whole transfer back through the system to get uh, charge separation. I should say that uh, other people, of course, have designed all sorts of systems. You don't necessarily have to use portraits as the electron uh, acceptors, but the idea is the same. All right, just to show you, these aren't flat molecules. <coughs> um, when Max uh, developed these, he was trying to mimic the design in the photosynthetic reaction centre. So in the case of that tetrad, which had a zinc portrait at one end and a gold portrait at the other, actual separation between the chromophores here through space separation is about 50 angstroms. Uh, but you can see the geometry here mimics the geometry in that photosynthetic system. And this is the triad structure here, also a bit structured. Okay, so this sort of shows you the type of complexity organic chemists can uh, bring to these problems to try and do photosynthetic mimics. Now, <clears throat> this just shows you the sort of energetics that you need to consider when you design up a molecular system to get charge separation. Uh, this is the triad here, the zinc porphyrin, free base porphyrin, gold porphyrin. I mentioned that if you excite the zinc porphyrin with light, uh, you get energy transfer to the free base porphyrin. So the energetics are such here that energy transfer is the favored pathway. Uh, so then you get excited free base porphyrin you have the gold portrait at the end. Then the redox 
properties are such then that you can get electron transfer to this system. Again, you lose energy. Uh, this, this is a very efficient process. Uh, but the problem there is that if you just have, we could look at models where we just have three basic gold porphyrin, the charge uh, recombination here is quite fast. So you get fast charge recombination if you don't have the six porphyrin here. But if the hole transfer can compete effectively, you can get um, hole transfer or back electron transfer to the zinc porphyrin. So this is a, uh, a an example where you can get uh, reasonably good charge separation. But the problem here, and it's a problem in all these types of designs, is that the energetics is such that the hole transfer, the hole transport in this back step is fairly marginal. So there's not much difference in the energies of those two states, and you can alter this with solvent. So in toluene, for instance, this one doesn't happen. But if you change it to a polar solvent, uh, you can alter this so you do get some hole transfer. So we're getting into the environment now. You need to manipulate the solvent. You can adjust the energetics here so that you uh, get some hole transfer. And I was, you can see I put a block here because this is something we realised after we started this, that really what we want to do is lower the energy of this state so that we really get efficient hole transfer uh, back here. So what could you do to this system to actually alter the energetics of this energy level here? Okay, and uh, I should mention that the, uh, the work we do at Melbourne is really measuring rates in, under various environments using uh, uh, time level spectroscopy, ultra-fast spectroscopy. The rates in this case aren't all that fast, although reasonable. So these have been determined by using either fluorescence, time resolved fluorescence, or transient absorption spectroscopy using picosecond laser systems. So <coughs> these are the rates of energy transfer here, charge separation step from the free base to the gold porphyrin and uh, the, the whole transfer uh, first step uh, as a rate here of about 10 to the 7, 4 by 10 to the 7. So in this case, <coughs> the lifetime you get, the charge separated lifetime is about 150 nanoseconds in benzonitrile, and the quantum yield of formation about 0.8. So quite an efficient system. The problem here is, of course, this is not a exceptionally long charge separated state lifetime. In the photosynthetic system, if you didn't have any other process occurring, uh, that charge separated state last for a milliseconds or so. Okay, so with the tetrad, <coughs> of course we had another step, so we have two whole transport steps, so you really separate the electrons. Uh, again, the rates of all these steps have been measured by looking at either the dyads and then the triads and then the tetrads, you can model these quite efficiently. But hopefully you get the message that you can do a lot of molecular design to make these types of really elegant structures and then tune it either with solvent or by choosing a methylation in this case to adjust the energy um, state or energy trend or electron redox states. Okay, so in this case, in this tetrad, which is a beautiful system, your shifting charge, the charge shift state you've got here, over 50 angstroms, you can measure the lifetime of the final zinc plus that forms. Remember, that's at one end. You start off with zinc porphyrin, you get the whole transfer, you'll end up with. Uh, cation, and you can see that in transient spectroscopy, it's quite prominent, and the lifetime here in this tetrad is about 60 microseconds. So the charge separator stays lasting for about 60 microseconds before it recombines. So this is uh, also quite long-lived, but we knew that this energetics was such that <coughs> we could actually do a bit better. And I just wanted to show you how you can really by quite simple additions or manipulations of your environment change the system such that you really can get uh, an electron flow or an energetic flow here so that you get slow charge recombination. All you had to do with this was add chloride ions. And that complexes with the zinc. And because the ligand on the zinc metal here, you get a change in the absorption spectrum. You can see what happens. And it lowers the energetics of this state. And uh, this work... Uh, just about to be published, hasn't been quite published yet, but it's, uh, you can actually extend the lifetime of the CS state uh, into the millisecond region. Actually, if you look at the state so long lived, that in fact, if you look at it in solution, you see a second order decay because now the molecules are diffusing. Yep. All right, so uh, hopefully you can see molecular design, you can do all sorts of things. Just a couple of problems. <coughs> 
synthetic complexity. You have to make uh, you know, tons of this material. It would be quite a challenge. You lose energy up all the way down there, right? So the prime energy you get at the end, you know, you a lot of energy loss. It would be better if you could actually have self-assemble. I sort of self-assemble there just to say that rather than synthesize something, if you just pour it into solution, let them all self-assemble. Be synthetically useful and you get fast. Um, but the problem is the fast charge recombination if you're using molecular diodes. Even intramolecular charge separation, which you can make long live, would be better. And of course, that's quite a controversial area at the moment. There are all sorts of claims around about that. All right, well, I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I just uh, wanted to say a few words about light harvesting because I think uh, perhaps Paul might say a bit more about this. <coughs> and I'm just going to tie in something that uh, Ross was mentioned in the first day, and that's to do with energy transfer. So, light harvesting it means how do we uh, absorb light and then transport it to a reaction centre like I've been talking about. And <coughs> you can see here, uh, here we're looking at energy transfer between two free base porphyrins, linked porphyrins. You can probably see there the centre of that molecule we were talking about a minute ago. And you can monitor the rates of energy transfer between two chromophores just by looking at the polarisation of the fluorescence. And this is a work we did quite a while ago, but I thought I'd just put it up to uh, show Ross that we do actually do these measurements and the difficulties you might encounter looking at uh, uh, oscillations or quantum effects in this process. So you excite with polarised light, and because the transition dipoles of the two porphyrins aren't aligned, <coughs> you'll get depolarisation as the emission, uh, as the energy hops from one chromophore to another. Okay, you'll, you'll get depolarisation. So you can monitor the time dependence of the depolarisation if you excite with a polarised light pulse. So this is the type of information you get. So the anisotropy decays away. <coughs> and you can measure, you can model this to measure the rates of uh, energy popping between two chromophores. So in this case here, <coughs> um, this is the simulated anisotropy curve. And we can calculate it, we can assume just what we call foster or a dipole-dipole induced energy transfer process. And the experimental transfer rate here is faster, considerably faster. And in this case, we attributed that in those days to uh, additional mechanisms for energy transport, in particular the fact that the linking bridge can mediate the electronic coupling through this uh, super exchange process. So we can monitor energy transport. Uh, just a couple of structures, just to finish off. Different types of systems. I think Paul's going to talk about dendrimers a bit more. But we can also monitor energy transport in this uh, so-called porphyrin dendrimer. It's a really polypropylene in the dendrimer, which has porphyrins appended. I think Paul yeah. a true, has a true dendrimer, or a uh, chromophore dendrimer. But porphyrins here can be appended to this dendrimer, and then we can watch the uh, anisotropy decay. So <coughs> I'm not sure how many oscillations you can see in there, Ross. But, uh, there's plenty of noise, but uh, as I said, it's a while ago now, the data we can actually collect is, uh, is better now. But I noticed that when we model this, the straight line is actually a model to dipole-dipole uh, transfer of the system. It was a pretty good fit, although in the initial region, the fit wasn't all that good. Probably if we uh, looked a bit earlier, we might see some interesting effects. Okay, so just to finish off, um, I wanted to point out that we are really getting very sophisticated in what we can make to do light harvesting. I won't go into all the synthesis, but there's polymerization methods around now which can actually give us controlled synthesis of macromolecules containing chromophores. So this is an example where we have a ruthenium trispipi core. This is actually what we call them. A chain, uh, a chain transfer agent. But we use a process called raft, which is a raft polymerization. It's a controlled living polymerization process you can do at room temperature. And what you can do is just grow polymer chains using this uh, transfer agent, and uh, ruthenium based transfer agent, to grow chains out of the core. And you can add whatever chromophores you like. As long as they're a monomer, uh, you can. So in this case here, this is connected to this core here. So you come out to a Coumarin chromophores. In this case, I think you had there's only three or four. Then we put naphthalene chromophores afterwards, just by putting uh, a concentration of acenaphthalene in. 
and then we can make it water soluble by putting some more blocks in. So you just build it up in a blockwise manner. And <coughs> so this is a live harvesting parable. This is your trap, your vinium, and uh, the arms here are the light harvesting arms. So you can, I think there's one other slide here. It's a bit blurry there, but <coughs> essentially the energetics are set up here so that if you're excited at 295 nanometers, the emission you see comes out at 650. And the sort of transport efficiencies you can get, you need to design up the number of chromophores you have in each area. So I think it was about 70% was it for the um, Asian athlete to Coomeran and then uh, over 90% from Coomeran to within interest Nippy. Uh, so far, these are hard things to model. You can, the basic modeling we did was using a dipole dipole sort of foster mechanism, but it probably is a little bit more complicated than that. <coughs> and then you can manipulate environment, in this case solvent, to change the dimensions of your polymer uh, arms. So you can bring the chromophores close to the core, or move them out just by changing the solvent and you can get, uh, you can change the amount of um, transport you get to the refinium core. So, just to conclude, you can, through molecular architecture and environment, you do have a lot of control over electron and energy transfer processes. People get quite clever in what they can make these days. I'm sure we'll hear some more about that in a minute. You can achieve long-lived charge separation, but the problem is synthetic complexity and energy loss and we can talk about that maybe later if people want to have some suggestions. And uh, I should mention those polymers that I talked about at the end there, you can make hundreds of grams of this material. So this is a, what we would call a commodity, white harvesting polymer. So we're actually at the stage where we can make uh, very large amounts of these polymeric materials. So if we can develop systems for photovoltaics using these, uh, the, the chances are they won't be as expensive as some of the systems we, we're uh, using currently. Thank you. So, uh, would you please go to this anisotropy uh, slide? Yep. Uh, the one with the two chemicals? Yeah, right. Exactly. Which one so, here on? you have considered that anisotropy decay, that is R of T decay, yep. is only due to this energy transfer, dipole dipole coupling. But you know that if there is a dipole, then it is rotates in the solution phase, for example, when you start, then also you can get the decay. And the decay would be the size of the molecule and the decay, whatever you got, it would be comparable to that. should mention this is done in a glass. Okay. So these are in a frozen glass. So uh -huh. we got rid of the rotational motion leading to an isotropy. Oh, so okay. they're immobile. Uh, it is in a solid phase. Yeah. Okay. Solid phase. Now, uh, next uh, anisotropy, uh, that is the rise component. Ah, yes. How you are. Uh, ah, yes. yes, that's uh, probably a talk in itself, but um, you're talking about this rise in that model. Yeah. <coughs> that's actually, if you have two different lifetimes of all sure. That is only in the solid, solid phase, right? That's right. Okay. It's in the solid phase. So to do with two lots of chromophores, there's actually a, a sub lot of portraits in this dendrite, which have a different life So the heterogeneity heter mm -hmm. system. Cool. And um, the, the energy transfer process in uh, Nippy, uh, Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, so can you connect leads and get a voltage out of these things? I think that's what we call step three. Step three, <laughs> yeah. okay. It's cool. We're up to step two. Oh. Um, obviously some of these uh, materials uh, can potentially be used as a paper on I think there's no doubt we need some simpler systems, particularly on synthetic systems, because otherwise you'll be uh, losing not trivial systems to synthesize. So the answer is yes, uh, and I think that's what they're supposed to do over the next three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I'